Hello Penguin Arts, I'm the Beardy Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Beyond Kerbal. Today we're starting off by hiring three colonist type Kerbals. That is because we are sending another crew up to Artemis to replace the crew that we took off of our moon base in the previous episode. Now, we had a very, very positive reception to the first episode of the series. In fact, a lot of people finding the series for the first time have had numerous comments from people going back to the old Endurance series and binge watching the entire thing uh, in the last week since that first episode came out. So really positive response to that episode. I'm really happy you guys are enjoying things and things are only going to get more and more exciting as the series goes on. But thank you so much for all of the positive messages and support it really means a lot. So, for those of you who haven't seen this before, although of course you did see the upper half of it in the previous episode, leaving Nemesis uh, and Artemis, our base on that moon, this is our Asteria reusable transport system, sort of loosely based it off of the SpaceX Starship, although when I first created it, it was actually still the BFR. Of course, uh, this uses a three-stage rocket before actually you know, launching the upper segment, where a starship is only two segments. But we don't have access to nine meter wide parts, so we're having to make do with this. So you can see here, uh, we've changed our Atlas launch vehicle. It is actually the same launch vehicle, the same engine configurations and the like, but we've made the entire thing five meters because when it went down to 3.75 meters, it got a little bit tall and looked a little bit silly, at least in my opinion. And we're going to keep iterating on this launch vehicle. We, in fact, we actually perfect it later on in the episode. But Beardy, who have you got on board this crew? Who are you sending up to Artemis? Why are you sending them? And what's the purpose of this new mission? Because, of course, the reason we built Artemis was to construct the Bifrost Array, which was that massive uh, constellation of satellites which collected solar power and beamed it to our interstellar spacecraft. But we're not building another mega project like that again. So, why are we launching this? Well, I want to make Artemis 100% self-sufficient, because once we've proven we can do that, it's essentially a test bed for our future colonies that we're going to be sending to other worlds possibly and hopefully in another star system. So I want to sort of prove the technology, show that it can be done. I mean Artemis has basically just been a test bed for a lot of things. I've learned a lot about uh, USI's modular colonization system. It is basically another game in and of itself and it's required a lot of sort of back of napkin, I say back of napkin, I've been using post-it notes, I've got a little stack of post-it notes here with all of the math I've had to do to figure out all the production chains <laughs> you have to do uh, to get your side to work. It is uh, a very complicated mod and hence why we've uh, started a colony on uh, a moon so we can very easily get to it and uh, change things and add modules when they don't work. So you can see here we're trying to reuse the entire third stage this time instead of just the engine. Uh, unfortunately doing that means that it's a little back heavy and it flipped around and the expensive part we were trying to keep uh, kind of exploded and then we entered into a spin uh, because of the uneven sort of aerodynamics of that third stage try to disengage the heat shield and the entire thing exploded so you know not entirely successful but we're still testing this new launch system uh, so we'll perfect that a little later in the episode and yeah i did try and reuse the entire third stage go for full reusability but uh, no i don't seem to be able to get that down so we're just going to go back to trying to reuse the expensive bit the engine and just ditch the uh, the fuel tanks they really aren't that expensive to build at all so the Asteria, as you see here has arrived at nemesis and we can pretty much head straight to artemis we sort of seem to do this quite a bit. It seems to be that the time that we launch to Nemesis, we always seem to end up in an orbit which is very near to Artemis, uh, actually allowing us to just pretty much go straight there instead of really entering into an orbit around Nemesis. Now on board this spacecraft, we've of course got a pilot piloting the main spacecraft. We have a quartermaster, they're very important for USI's logistics because of course we have a number of mining installations across Nemesis and they can actually transfer resources into a planetary stockpile which then if you have a quartermaster or a pilot 
on board, although quartermasters are much better at it. They're a special Kerbal type added by USI. They can take resources out of that stockpile. So that's how you're how we're transferring all of our raw resources from our different mining installations to this one central base. Then we have a farmer. They're very important for harvesting organics, which is going to be important a little later in the episode. We have a biologist. So they're important for cultivating supplies. So, you know, producing food for our Kerbals to actually eat. Then instead of the previous eight engineers we had on Artemis, we've now gone down to, actually no, I think we had 12. Yeah, we had 12 engineers actually on Artemis. We've dropped that number all the way down to four because we're not going to be constructing massive great big solar arrays uh, we only have a couple of little projects uh, well one main project we're going to be doing this episode and then from then on maybe we'll just be producing like bits and bobs as and when artemis actually needs them so we only need four engineers because of course each engineer contributes to the total productivity of the whole colony which increases the rate at which you can build stuff off world and then finally we have our four colonists i believe i explained in the previous episode but colonists are a special kerbal type yet another one added by usi uh, and they basically just buff the amount of rewards you get for having a colony because just having a colony in usi gives you rewards which you can collect every now and then so having colonists buffs your funds reputation and science gains from having your colony um, whereas the other Kerbal types only buff one of them, uh, one or two of them, and not very much. However, they don't actually have any specialized skills. So you can see here, we just got uh, Harris Kerman, our engineer, to get out and connect the Asteria to Artemis. So now we can begin transferring things. So we brought a bunch of machinery with us to try and get things working again. We were pretty much out of machinery uh, by the time we left Artemis. Um, but I didn't want to have to resupply it halfway through building the Bifrost Array. So uh, a lot of our production chains aren't going at 100% efficiency because we used a lot of their machinery. What we're also doing is filling up the Asteria with refined exotics, which is very, very precious. Um, and I believe a full load of them back to Solitude will earn us about 8 million funds. So <laughs> yeah, you can see why we don't really need to do contract anymore in this series. Money is no longer an issue. So once we've got all of our various Kerbals, our 12 different Kerbals, originally uh, we had 18 on the base, but uh, it, it's much easier to support 12 when it comes to life support and also our colonization module which we are going to be building uh, very shortly but we have to activate all of our systems first i did actually have to relaunch artemis uh, to get it to work in the new version so um yeah it's <laughs> it's a little different in the layout and some people might notice some of the changes but uh yeah because just loading it into the new save file or well, the new version uh, a lot of the parts didn't work, so I basically had to rebuild it exactly as it was, relaunch it using HyperEdit. Um, so now we have to reactivate all of our various different systems and production chains. So for those of you who didn't watch Endurance, again, I would highly recommend that you do watch it, but uh, Artemis currently is self-sufficient on supply, so it's the life support, uh, and it also produces machinery and specialized parts. Those are the two resources you need to build things off world. So we're actually going to demonstrate that right now. As you can see here, we're getting Harris Kerman, our, our lead engineer here, since Ben Kerman is now off on Tycho Station, and he's going to stick a survey stake in the ground. So you can build things on that launch pad, that deployable launch pad you can just see to the left there, but you can also deploy survey stakes in the ground and build craft off to the side so you know on the ground nearby your construction area and that is where we're going to build our artemis colonization module the final module of this base which will get us to a hundred percent self-sufficiency so what we're not self-sufficient on is machinery which is a resource pretty much used by every different production chain just sort of keeps things ticking over um, and we're also not self-sufficient when it comes to habitation. See, our Kerbals still need to come home after about two years or so of habitation on Artemis. And I want to make it so they can stay up there indefinitely. Thankfully, USI added a very helpful module called the Colonization Module. And that uses a resource called Colony Supplies to freeze the habitation timers of your Kerbals. Now, Colony Supplies are actually very expensive and very hard to manufacture. They require not only material kits and specialized parts, but also organic which is a resource you have to produce by farming. It is a separate resource to, uh, to the supplies that our Kerbals actually eat. So, 
what we've got on our new colonization module is a pair of agricultural modules which use the substrate which we're already mining and the fertilizer we're already producing for our supplies farms so farms that produce actual food we can eat then we have an assembly plant two of the bays of which are producing machinery which is produced out of material kits and specialized parts and then one final bay is producing colony supplies out of material kits specialized parts and of course organics which we're now producing and then the final two modules are colonization modules each of which can freeze the half timers of six kerbals so now we've filled it with machinery and we've got it operational our base is self-sufficient thankfully we're already producing uh, more than enough material kits and specialized parts to get this colony supply production chain going we had to adjust some of the values but after a bit of tinkering you can see that all of the important resources are in the green and we are now self-sufficient now we're not technically a hundred percent self-sufficient because the only resource that we are actually draining is our nuclear fuel which I believe is going to last 145 years. So yeah, I don't think that reactor is going to be short of fuel anytime soon, at least within the lifespan of this colony. So yes, yeah, not technically self-sufficient. We could actually set up um, a nuclear fuel processing, well, mining and processing plant to then make it 100% self-sufficient. But uh, yeah, I think 145 years of self-sufficiency is probably more than enough. So now we've got the base self-sufficient. What are we doing? Well, I do actually have the breaking ground expansion and I haven't really taken advantage of it yet. So I thought that we'd use the base to build ourselves a little container filled with all of the new breaking ground deployable science parts and actually have a little mess around with them. So first of all, we have Harris Kerman. He's going to be deploying here our experiment control station. And then he's going to head back and power this with a RTG. I decided not to use the solar panels because, of course, there are quite long days and quite long nights here on Nemesis. And so it would not have power through the night so just use an RTG now by using an engineer we get three times the amount of power from this RTG unfortunately I don't have a scientist on board the base I have the next best thing I have a biologist here in the form of Milry Kerman uh, and Milry is going to be deploying our science experiments now biologists are a type of scientist so I don't know if I do actually get the buff from this but uh, most likely not considering you can't use biologists or any of the USI kerbals in science labs which of course require scientists so we're probably not getting the buffs from uh, deploying these properly with a scientist but uh, oh well you know it's fine we can pretend I mean we're not really going to get that much science from these things anyway uh, but we are going to be taking them on our future missions to other worlds and uh, certainly making a lot more use of the deployed science now unfortunately uh, until I believe Copernicus gets an update and also unless Games Links the creator of After Kerbin puts in a bunch of work we're not going to have the unique surface scatters uh, across the surfaces of any worlds i would have to i mean i think it is possible to change a save file so put a seed into the save file so it does produce them um but of course you need to have planets that actually support those uh <laughs> those unique surface features uh so yeah unfortunately we're not going to be able to find any cryo volcanoes or, or use the robotic scanning arms or any of those features of breaking ground but we can use the deployable science as you see here have a little play with that and uh, use the robotic parts so now we're going to head over to the tech tree and use some of our science to unlock an upgrade for the open cycle gas core nuclear rocket because that is what is going to be powering our next interplanetary mission and that's what we're going to be launching the materials for right now so our next interplanetary mission is going to be heading to the wasteland that is a new name for Kerbin and we're going to be heading back there not with just a small lander to just briefly explore the surface like we did last time. This time we are going there to stay for an extended mission. This is like the Artemis program. Don't get confused with my base Artemis. I mean the real life Artemis program <laughs> of our save file. Except of course we're not going back to the moon to stay. We're going back to another planet to stay. So this is going to be named the Constellation Mission. And 
There is actually a naming theme, uh, but I won't spoil the uh, the names of the other parts of the mission just yet. I'll let you guys figure out what the naming theme is in future episodes. So it's going to consist, of course, a main spacecraft powered by this very efficient nuclear engine, which we have just unlocked an upgrade for and only recently unlocked anyway. I did consider using a fusion engine, but our research into fusion propulsion just isn't advanced enough yet. And currently our fission engines are much, much better. You can see here that I've perfected the uh, Atlas launch vehicle, but I'll explain more about that later. So, what it's going to consist of is, of course, that mothership and then a mobile base, which has drills, and it's going to move around the surface of the wasteland, and it's going to resupply itself. And on board, it has an inflatable greenhouse, and we're going to farm supplies, so our crew can stay on their surface of uh, wasteland in their base, pretty much indefinitely. Now we don't have um, anything to freeze their hab timers but they're all experienced Kerbals so the mission should be around four years long uh, which I think is quite exciting. Of course I've got a mobile processing lab so they're going to be producing all sorts of science while on the surface. We do also have a separate lander which will be heading to Malice and since Malice is covered in regolith we can actually mine alumina from that regolith and use it to refuel a aluminium hybrid rocket. So using aluminium as a solid rocket fuel with liquid oxygen as an oxidizer allowing us to actually throttle the engine even though it is technically um, a solid fuel that we're using. So it's a hybrid engine as if you know our comparisons to Scott Manley's Interstellar Quest uh, couldn't get um, <laughs> any worse. We are actually producing a self-refueling lander to explore all of the biomes of the moon of the wasteland, Malice. And then finally we have a crew SSTO, which of course will be transferring the crew down to the mobile base and back up again when the mission is complete. I'm really quite excited. I've designed all of this all in one go and what we're launching here is a giant container filled with material kits and specialized parts. So this contains all of the resources necessary to build the Constellation mission in its entirety. So it's saving us having to launch everything up in individual modules and launch all the different spacecraft separately and then fuel all up. No, we're building it all in orbit using Tyco. Now, I, d I didn't want to do a tape gaming. The tape gaming is a guy I used to do videos with. I used to love him, um, but he's working now. I've had a lot of, a lot of questions about where he's gone. <laughs> it's almost like a Macy Dean level of is he dead, but he started work uh, after uni and he didn't have time to do YouTube anymore. I haven't spoken to him in quite a while, um, but he used to have a series called Road to Colonization. Well, Road to Exploration followed by Road to Colonization, which is a little bit of an inspiration for this series. Uh, and he spent loads of funds and resources building this orbital construction dock in the first episode of Road to Colonization, much like we built Tycho, and then he never used it. <laughs> he built it and then used it like all once in the final episode of the series to build something um, so we're definitely not going to do that we're going to make sure we use Tyco extensively and as you can see we have actually perfected our launch vehicle now and um, it, I think it looks pretty good and I decided to rename it since it's, it's changed so much since the original Atlas uh, launch vehicle in the beginning of the last episode uh, so I decided to yeah pay a little homage to tape because um, he used to have a launch vehicle called the Pulsar I say a launch vehicle a series of launch vehicles called the Pulsar uh, in his road to colonization series so yeah I'll pay a little bit of a tribute to tape miss you bud and uh, yeah we're gonna call this the Pulsar launch vehicle it can get 250 tons into orbit and it is almost 100% reusable now, the reason uh, it can now actually get even more into orbit is because I changed the engine configurations of each of the stage um, from what they were earlier in the episode. So instead of having one massive engine in the first stage, we now had a cluster of 10 of the Making History F1 engines. And then in the next stage, instead of, again, one massive KW rocket cheer engine, we found it was much more efficient to have a cluster of vector engines so those space shuttle ones and then finally we have this uh, j2 engine which is very efficient in vacuum as our final third stage and once again we are just reusing the engine and that worked pretty well so we perfected our launch vehicle and now we can begin constructing our constellation mission of course we need to launch all the fuel for it and the crew but we'll do that in the next episode thank you very much for watching everyone i've been the bearded penguin and i'll see you all next time